So welcome to the uh, YouTube discussion on Polish-Ukrainian relations. My name is William Such, and I'll be moderating. Our panel guests include Adam Reichardt, Editor-in-Chief of New Eastern Europe, a bi-monthly magazine which covers Central and East European affairs. We're also joined by Dr. Taras Kuzio, a specialist on Ukrainian political, economic, and security affairs. Gentlemen, thank you both kindly for joining. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Adam, I'd like to begin with you. What is your assessment of current Polish-Ukrainian relations? <laughs> well, it's a very um, deep question. I, I mean, I think you have to look at it from uh, several different uh, angles and, and perspectives. I think first is, and foremost, the most important in some sense is the political level uh, on in Polish-Ukrainian relations, which I would assess uh, is generally quite poor at the moment. Um, and we could lay blame on both sides uh, for the situation um, in, in Poland, particularly is uh, very oversensitive uh, in terms of how Ukraine has been pursuing its own uh, identity politics uh, since the 2014 revolution. So these wounds have been opened up again, um, particularly on the political level. Um, partly has to do with the fact that there has not been a true comprehensive um, reconciliation process between Poland and Ukraine, uh, in my opinion. And I think this is probably one of the core uh, problems of why these wounds can be so opened up. Um, but so, so that's the political side uh, and, and there's a rhetoric on both sides, which are not really helping um, on the highest political levels, particularly uh, if we look at some of the influence of nationalisms in both sides of the country. And if we look at other levels, however, I would say that Polish-Ukrainian level, uh, Polish-Ukrainian relations aren't as bad as they're often made out to be uh, in February 2018. So one particular area, we have to look at the level of technical assistance that Poland continues to provide to Ukraine, particularly in certain areas such as administrative and decentralization reform. Uh, the amount of funding uh, tech and technical assistance that is provided from on behalf of the Polish government in Ukraine is still relatively high. Uh, those levels um, were increased since uh, the Polish uh, government changed at the end of 2015. So there is, uh, so is beyond, below the ret rhetorical level, there is actually some um, assistance taking place on the ground. And I think the third uh, and very important point, which is often missed in terms of Polish-Ukrainian relations, is the societal level, the people-to-people -people relations. This is a this is an area um, which, prior to um, even the most recent years, has been the most lacking. I think, uh, in my opinion, um, where in where we had seen actually in early two thousands uh, quite high level of political support. Uh, on both sides for you in, in Polish-Ukrainian relations, but less of the societal face-to-face -face, uh, context. Now, with open borders between Poland and Ukraine, uh, more movement between the two countries, especially along the borderlands, um, Ukrainian uh, migrant workers uh, coming into Poland and students as well. I mean, I think that, that there's estimates, there's no real official, good official st statistics, but estimates point between somewhere between 800,000 and 1.2 million Ukrainians are in Poland at any given time. And this has had actually a real effect on um, mainstream Poland's view of Ukraine in a very, in a very positive sense. Um, and I hope that I, and I, from what I understand, at least from people I talk to in Ukraine, it has also a very positive effect in a uh, Ukrainian uh, point of view from the Ukrainian social societal aspect as well. So you have a lot of exposure on a much lower level uh, between Poles and Ukrainians. Uh, Ukrainians are working in a lot of different sectors in Poland and um, and it's very visible. I have to say that you go in any of the big cities. I, I live in Krakow, but you know you can go to Krakow, go to Warsaw, Gdańsk, Wrocław, and you will find uh, Ukrainians um, quite easily. It's, it's not that they're a hidden um, part of society. They're very much um, playing a role here, especially in terms of uh, of filling in a lot of the workforce, which has emptied out as Poland's uh, unemployment rate has dropped quite significantly over the last few years. They are in need of a workforce and Ukrainians are filling in that need. Uh, and it's been, and it, I think it's the impact on Polish-Ukrainian relations is not talked enough in terms of the positive side of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it is important to, um, to talk about the positives as well as the negatives. And uh, it's ironic to find 
that uh, you can travel, as Adam was saying, you can travel anywhere around Poland and meet Ukrainian workers. And the same is true about Polish workers anywhere in Britain. I mean, go to the middle of the Scottish Highlands, which where I was in late October, and you will find Poles working there. So it's sort of the mirror image of that. Um, and they have a good reputation in Britain. They are, some, some East European countries don't, but the Poles do have a good reputation. They're not involved in crime, for example, and, and uh, people smuggling as some other people are. Um, so I, I think that is important to, to stress. I was in Sopot in uh, September of last year near Gdansk, and um, in the local restaurant and bar, there was a one one girl from, one young teenager from Dnipropetrovsk, now Dnipro, and one one other person, one other uh, female teenager from Zaporizhia. So that goes to show you the degree to which Ukrainians are found out working in Poland. And that's important because uh, Russians and Belarusians are not doing that. So these are Ukrainians primarily. Again, this will help to differentiate Ukrainians from Russians and Belarusians. So I think that that's important, that people to people. So I, there is a kind of a Jekyll and Hyde aspect to the Polish nationalist government. But going back to the the more kind of negative stuff, the I don't think it's 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 correct to place on the same moral level uh, President Poroshenko and the Polish nationalist government. Poroshenko is not a nationalist in the sense of uh, uh, the, the the people running Poland today. Uh, Poroshenko is a, is a, is a businessman uh, centrist. I mean, you know, he, he's always been um, kind of on the, I would say, center-left liberal centrist position. He's, he's, he's not going to go on the streets and support nationalist rallies like some of the people in the, in the Polish uh, Law and Justice Party. Um, also, I think it's kind of a bit wrong to say that a lot of the stuff that's happening in Poland, some of it I'm sure is, but it's not all in response to what's happening in Ukraine. Um, yes, nationalists everywhere in the world, including Trump with his Twitters uh, and nationalists in Europe, need enemies. They need internal and external enemies. And, and the EU, Germany, Russia, and to some extent Ukraine. But this whole uh, evolution of, of Polish sort of victimization complex, I call it, particularly over claiming that what happened in Berlin was a genocide against Poles committed by Ukraine nationalists, didn't begin in 2014. It's been been happening for the last 10 to 15 years. It's been a gradual process since 2003. It's been sort of bubbling along. Um, and uh, some historians like Grzegorz Motyka, who previously were more objective and balanced, have had to move with the tide, as it were, and now accept that kind of position. On, on, on the Ukraine's identity issues, um, opinion polls in Ukraine show that ethnic nationalism is very weak. And you can see that um, in, in, in polls that show uh, how um, a huge number of Ukrainians, like 75-80% of Ukrainians, have very negative views of Russian leaders. This is very new. As previously, that would be just West Ukrainians. But so they have very negative views of Putin, State Duma, Russian government, but they do not have very high negative views of the Russian people. So that's not ethnic nationalism. It's not ethnically directed against Russia. It's against the people who have caused this war. Um, and and I think that the 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 obviously the big bone of contention are the four decommunization laws of April 2015. But I think there's some mythology about this. Uh, firstly, um, and I'll just quickly say it. Firstly, and I'm sure this doesn't apply to Poland, to the Polish nationalist leaders, but uh, one reason why many people are not happy about this, including David Marples, who organized the Western Petition against the, against the laws, is that left-wing Western academics and people in Moscow don't like the equating of Nazi and Soviet crimes, um, which I don't have a problem with, and I don't think most people in Poland do, um, including the Polish government. But that that is something that this these laws do. They equate totalitarianism of Nazism and Soviet rule, communist rule, as on the same negative level. That doesn't 
that's something that doesn't is not something that's accepted by a lot of people on the left. And it's been this is a long time it's been happening. This um, left wing academics have never been able to accept that um, Soviet communism or communism in general was as evil as Nazism. I remember that from my own days at the University of Birmingham in the 1990s when I was doing my PhD, where a lot of the professors were communists and they refused to accept there was a, a kind of a moral equivalency. But and the second question is this, you know, in this list of which was foolish, this list of, uh, of uh, hero, of not heroes, sorry, of fighters for Ukrainian independence. It's important to get the right term. They are listed as fighters for Ukrainian independence, not as heroes. Um, and in that list of fighters for Ukrainian independence includes, of course, Ukrainian groups like OWN and the Ukrainian insurgent army, UPA. And that obviously is something that's rankled people in Poland. But I would just respond to that to say that I might not personally be a big fan of Stepan Bandera, but I cannot see a Ukraine history which excludes him. You know, Ukraine history has to include all the, all the, everybody that was part of your history. And in the Polish side, you might have a few people you want to forget about, and on the Ukraine side as well. But you can't exclude Oun Upa and Bandera from Ukraine history. So they are listed there. And an inclusive history includes everybody. Uh, um, it doesn't mean to say that they are necessarily, you know, going to be forced down people's throats as heroes. Um, but th so, I, th those are the two major issues. Um, in general, the decommunization laws were on the same level as many other countries: Poland, Czech Republic, Baltic republics, and Ukraine today has the freest access to KGB archives anywhere in the former USSR outside the Baltic states. And that's a product of those laws. And you know, you have many Western academics who go to sit in those archives in Kiev, and I've sat in them myself, and also people who have lost relatives to Soviet terror have gone looking for information about their family members. So there's, you know, there are, there are positives and negatives to these, um, to these things, but I'll leave it at that. But yes, I think it is important to stress both the positive and the and the negative, and I guess um, uh, when politicians start messing around with history, there's always going to be problems. During this past week, we've seen a flurry of activity, particularly with uh, articles by Marcy Shore and Anne Applebaum in response to the Institute of National Remembrance in Poland and President Andrzej Duda saying that he'll sign changes into law. Uh, which provides, uh, in particular, punishment for crimes of Ukrainian nationalists, and he's going to send it to the Constitutional Court. It's been passed by the Senate, passed by the Siem. Is there a competition? Is there a, a conflict? Is there some cooperation? Uh, is it uh, back and forth between the Institute of National Remembrance in Poland and the Ukrainian Institute of National Remembrance in Kiev? In terms of, because this law has caused... Uh, Quite controversy, not only on the uh, the, the section dealing with with Ukraine uh, and, and uh, outlawing what they call propagating and promoting banderism in, in Poland, uh, which I suspect is going to be something hard to find. Uh, in particular, and actually, allow me, Tadas, if I may, just respond briefly to to what you said earlier, because mm, Tadas likes to say that the Polish government is a nationalist government. I think it's unfair to just flatly label the law and justice government as a nationalist government. Because in Poland there are nationalist groups which are real nationalists and uh, organizations and they are not in the government and then related to the government. Of course, part of the government's electorate may be found in that group. But um, but there are very there are very many elements of, uh, of kind of more right center, maybe further right I would say, in the government. But in my opinion it would be uh, unfair to just uh, use the label nationalist for the entire government. So that said, uh, in terms of this, this law um, regarding outlawing uh, an action that relates to, to the source of where that, uh, the whole piece about promoting banderism in Poland comes from, because as far as I understand, it uh, comes from one of the factions, which is not actually part of the ruling party, uh, from the Kukis, uh, Kukis uh, party, which is kind of a, a, a wide grouping, it's an umbrella grouping of, of anti-establishment figures. Um, 
and under the, the leadership of Pavel Kukis, who used to be uh, a singer uh, in, in the 80s and uh, early 90s in Poland, and he created this formation to be anti-establishment. And part of his formation, there are real nationalists, real nationalist groups and, uh, and figures, and they pushed into this law the, uh, the wording and the, the part about uh, outlawing, promoting banderism, and, and they celebrated the success uh, of it being passed. It, in reality, I mean, I think it will hurt, you know, relations uh, diplomatically for obvious reasons, but beyond that, um, there's no, I, I don't really see uh, the Institute of National Memory really pursuing that, uh, that, that thread or that kind of part of the law in, in, in its work after it's, after it's uh, signed and, and implemented. But, but we will see. Well, you know, the, the, one of the things we should bring up here, um, which we have to um, uh, recognize, is that, you know, when we compare these two institutes, Polish Institute of National Memory and the Ukrainian equivalent, these are very disproportionate institutes. I mean, the Polish one has, if I'm not mistaken, a thousand plus uh, employees and has regional branches throughout Poland. Maybe even more than a thousand. I can't remember if it's a thousand or two thousand, but certainly a huge number of people. With regional branches, huge huge government budget, probably increased with the the neo-nationalist government in power in Poland. Um, the Ukrainian one, the equivalent, which was kind of set up a bit partly under Yushchenko, then disbanded under Yanukovych, and then revived in 2014, has 40 employees, or zero. You can't compare the two. No. I mean, the idea that somehow this is just a Ukrainian monothol mon mon monolith that sort of spreading national propaganda is simply ridiculous. It's a very small institution. I've been to uh, Volodymyr Vyatrovich's office many times, um, and actually donating books I collected previously in Poland and such like. They, they don't have many resources. Um, and Vyatrovich has become this kind of bogeyman figure in Poland, and yet I suspect 95% of the people who talk about him have never read his books. So I mean I, mean, I, 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 I understand that there are uh, nationalist groups further to the right um, than the Law and Justice Party. That doesn't mean to say that the Law and Justice Party is not a nationalist populist movement. By nationalist populist, what we mean is something that equi equivalent to say uh, UKIP in Britain. You know, it's it's a party which is to the right of a typical centre right party, but of course not fascist or Nazi. So it's somewhere in that. In that spectrum, and I think law and justice, everybody classifies it within that spectrum. Now, of course, of course there are going to be different factions in there, and it's a, it's a very eclectic group, particularly, you know, because that kind of group of people in pre-war Poland were very pro-Russian and anti-German um, and anti-Ukrainian. But today, you don't get pro-Russianism does not buy you votes in Poland. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, but, but I mean, I, I think that um, the, yes, the, the, the searching for banderites will not lead to um, any concrete results, but it's bound to have an impact on people working at the Polish Institute because they are a government institution, their salaries are government funded, so they're going to have to do what the government uh, says. And, and that's already been seen with, with, this, with very previously very good historians like Grzegorz Motyka, who, who had to go with the flow, which is that you now have to define what Ukraine nationalists did as genocide. It's no longer the case as in the 90s, you defined them as, you know, just crimes. Now it's genocide. And with that kind of government pressure, uh, they're going to have to sort of do that. And, and that, to me, just resembles what we had a bit in communist Poland. I mean, they're, they're tacked tactics of law and justice are surprisingly very communistic. I just want to get your uh, briefly your opinion on <clears throat> Anne Applebaum and uh, Marcy Shore. They were they were very harsh in in terms of their assessment of this new law being passed in Poland. Are, are they being harsh or overly harsh? So again, maybe I should clarify where my position is because I'm, you know, try to be as objective uh, as possible uh, from like an observer standpoint here. Um, I don't want to get too involved in the, the, the whole emotional details of it, but it's important to understand that Anna Alphabaum, who I know and respect, um, 
and she's done some great work, especially uh, in her most recent books um, on Holodomor um, is, uh, is, is quite, quite well done. But uh, have to also understand that her husband is a former minister from the previous government. Um, I wouldn't call her the most objective person when assessing something that comes out of, uh, you know, the government which is, he is in opposition to. So there's a bit of a conflict of interest from my personal point of view in her writing about that. So, um, of course, uh, Marcy Shore is very bright and, you know, wife Timothy Snyder, who is who knows this region inside out, um, clearly understand what they're talking about. But I think, you know, the biggest problem about this law, and you have to look at it more in the wider context, not just in terms of its Polish-Ukrainian element, but uh, but the, the entire Polish history in terms of how it is approaching a history of role Poland played uh, or didn't play during the Holocaust. Um, this is extremely sensitive to Poland, and uh, they're very, um, trying, they're struggling, to be honest, in my opinion, struggling to find a way to deal with the problem of uh, certain, at least, uh, ignorant journalists who uh, easily, uh, inadvertently, in most cases, claim that uh, death camps during World War II were Polish death camps, just because they were on Polish territory. Um, and so, the, the law itself, I mean, I don't, I would, in my opinion, would say it's not the best approach, because it's is trying to just take a hard approach towards um, towards either historical ignorance or defamation, uh, when in fact it should be much more of a broader uh, approach it should, in terms of education, uh, information campaigns. Um, you know, invite journalists, international journalists, to come to Poland and learn history uh, based on uh, based on research and understanding rather than just outlaw the use of certain expressions, which, you know, I think is very difficult to enforce. Um, I, I can't imagine when, and I think this is particularly what those articles were more referring to when, when uh, somebody refers to a situation which happened in Poland um, and there's an oversensitive and emotional reaction to it because it wasn't clearly uh, researched. Um, th th then what is the next step? I mean, the Polish uh, prosecution is going to try to prosecute a journalist for using the expression Polish death camps, a journalist based somewhere, I don't know, in, in, in the U.S. There's very little uh, tools to enforce this kind of law. So I think uh, that, you know, the point of view should be looking at how does Poland fight for its place in historical memory? Um, and doing it in a very positive way, and a way that uh, does not uh, cause such an emotional reaction as we've seen over the past few days. Issues of um, bad things that happen in your history is not something that just Poles have a problem dealing with. As I wrote in a recent piece in New Eastern Europe, um, there are many countries in Europe with skeletons in their closet that they don't want to be, bring out. Poles are not the only ones, Ukrainians and others. Um, you know, I was in Berlin about a year ago and I went to a, a great exhibition about um, one of the first recorded uh, genocides in history, which was the German in Empire did in Namibia. Mm. So the Germans have done a fantastic job in overcoming their Nazi past. They've done the best out of all the Axis powers, but they're still just now coming to terms with what they did before the Nazis came to power. You know, and it took the French four, four decades to deal with the fact that they, one and a half million people died in the Algerian Civil War. It took the Brits seven decades to deal with Northern Ireland. So these things take time, um, and there are going to be mistakes along the way. You know, as a political scientist, I'm not surprised about these things. I mean, I mean, they, they obviously foolishly should have, you know, what they should have done is invite Jewish scholars or Jewish politicians in, Let's work this out together and then in the end come up with a final agreed product of how to deal with this. But, you know, they are nationalists in that sense. They take a sledgehammer to a nut, to a, to a, to a, to a peanut, as it were, and, and, and this is the end result. So I, I'm not surprised. Ukrainians are sensitive as well um, and, you know, about, about various, various issues. Although Ukrainians have been at, the, have been at the brunt of attacks about their fascistic anti-Semitic nationalism 
for far longer than the Poles have. Uh, um, you know, from the Polish communist regime, the Soviet communist regime, and such like. So I, I'm not surprised that these things are sensitive. Um, um, but I'm also not surprised that this kind of government will will not deal with it in the right way. Um, because, but you know, Yushchenko didn't do a good job either, by the way, in, in many of these areas. You know, so. What is your sense of the current reflection of Ukraine in uh, larger Western media? Is uh, is the New York Times and Washington Post and BBC are they getting it right? I mean, I, I'm happy to start on this one. They, uh, I mean, there's very little written in the Western media about Ukraine-Polish relations. It's very, very, very rarely comes up. I mean, I don't see it ex except in specialist publications like New Eastern Europe. I mean, the typical newspaper doesn't really cover it. I think that uh, Ukraine gets a bad rap for, for, for two main reasons, um, wrongly. Uh, well, firstly, because, look, I mean, uh, it's still the same as in the Soviet Union. Western journalists are all sitting in Moscow, not sitting in Kiev. There's one or two newspapers that are based in uh, Kiev, like Reuters, Financial Times and such like, but it's still basically everybody sat in Moscow. That inevitably influences what's written. Um, and and I don't th think that uh, they've been very fair about the changes in Ukraine since 2014. Uh, um, you know, th there's plenty to criticize um, Ukraine leaders, but let me just put two things forward um, about uh, this. I've got something being published this week, that's why it's fresh for me. The, um, firstly, um, the EU doesn't have a right to be so critical towards Ukraine. It's not offering Ukraine membership. If it was offering Ukraine membership like Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, and with the same kind of level of financial assistance as they received, then they'd have every right to demand of Ukraine, these are what you need to do, do them. There's no free lunch. But they're not offering Ukraine membership. They're offering Ukraine an association agreement, which is enlargement light or integration without membership. So if you're only offering a half-hearted member, you know, semi-membership, not even membership, but kind of a semi, huh? you're just offering basically access to the EU market and a few other trappings, then I'm sorry, you have no right to be as demanding as for the Central and East Europeans. Secondly, all of the criticism from the West tends to be against Poroshenko, the president. And yet people tend to forget Ukraine is not a presidential system. I was just on a U.S. consultancy in Ukraine uh, reviewing U.S. Uh, financial assistance to reforming the Ukrainian parliament. The U.S. is the biggest a financial supporter of reform in the Ukrainian parliament since 1994. Um, so that's nearly 25 years. Uh, the EU has just come in two years ago, in March 2016, mm -hmm. with a big 52 list of recommendations of what to do for the Ukrainian parliament. Well, sorry, you know, you just come in. The Americans have been there for nearly 25 years. Um, and so the uh, Ukraine is a parliamentary system. It's a, it's classified as semi-presidential, which, what does that mean? It means that you have two executives. You have the government and the president. So it's divided. It's not a full parliamentary, it's not a full presidential system. That means that you don't just blame the president for everything going wrong in Ukraine. Parliament also is involved. And, and you know, there are a lot of people frustrated, including the US government, with its assistance in Parliament. It's not just the President Poroshenko all the time. So I think those two factors we should bear in mind. But at the same time, yes, Western newspapers tend to tend to focus on the negative. They don't focus on the positive because positive news doesn't sell newspapers. This it, this has been this has been the biggest period of um, reformist policies adopted in Ukraine since 1991. The period since 2014, a huge range of areas, pensions education, healthcare, done by an American-Canadian, American-Canadian, Ukrainian couple, the Sopruns, which is now acting health minister. Um, banking, um, e energy, NAFTA has Ukraine, the state energy company, used to soak up 4% of Ukraine's GDP in subsidies. Today, it's the biggest financial contri contributor to the Ukrainian budget. So corruption has been reduced there. Uh, new anti-corruption institutions, and so on and so on and so on. So I, I think there's there's a lot still to do, some of which is very unpopular with certain politicians like Timoshenko, 
which is very against land reform, land privatization. But that would be, I think, quite common in Eastern Europe. You know, nationalists and populists tend to jump on this bandwagon. Oh, if we privatize land, then, you know, oligarchs and foreigners will come and take it. But and they need to get an anti-corruption court set up this year. But there's a there's a there's a lot that's been done, which unfortunately is not focused upon. So I, I think that um, the you know you, you, Ukraine is doing not badly. A it's not getting the carrot of membership from the EU, which was a massive inducement for especially not for Poland so much. Um, but for, for countries that were laggards in reform, like Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine doesn't have that carrot. And Ukraine's also in a country that's at war, for Christ's sake. Let's not forget that. You know, 6% of Ukraine's GDP is, is, goes to the defense budget. 6%. That's more than any NATO member, including the US. So, so um, I think that, you know, I'm always debating with colleagues in the West, is the glass half full, is the glass half empty? In Ukraine, it's both. It's always both. It's always both. But it's not as bad as, you know, as, as Western media portray it. And certainly on the question of what we talked about earlier on, nationalists, for example, you know, uh, and they focus on sometimes of these marches in Kiev of, of guys dressed in black. I mean, they don't have any popularity in Ukraine's elections. They've They've, they've, they've once entered the Ukrainian parliament in 2010, Swoboda got 10%, and that's been it. So, you know, again, that's sort of exaggerated. But anyway, Adam, what does it look like from the vantage point of, of Krakow, if not <laughs> well? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, Thales, I, agree, I agree with your assessment. I think that um, there is a lot that is being done in Ukraine that is widely underreported uh, in terms of reforms. And I think, uh, you know, and, and, and as you mentioned, uh, what sells uh, in the West is, is negative news. And there's the other element of... of uh, oh, these, these things, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's the other element, of course, of, uh, of uh, the information campaign against Ukraine. Uh, I mean, they still are at a state of war or de facto war with, with Russia. Uh, and it's in Russia's interest to, to promote uh, Ukraine as failing you know, in its Western reforms. And so they are actively promoting this narrative in Western media, and there's no real good counter, uh, counter argument that is, that is taking place. So that's a serious problem, I think, for the image of Ukraine. And then it is easy, is, as, as you mentioned, uh, it's easy to use images of people who are in, uh, you know, in the hoods uh, with flags or with, you know, with the burning candles and all that to make it look like things are really bad. Um, and I have, you know, I just even a, a personal story, a, a friend of mine is organizing a trip um, with uh, colleagues from Germany and she asked where, where they should go and I suggested Kiev because it's a great city. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, the great feel, it's great to, to visit, they've never been in Eastern Europe. And, uh, and she agreed, she, she said, sounds great, but the German friends of hers uh, said they were, no way, they're not going, it's a country that's poor, uh, you know, Crime on the streets is, is, is way up, nationalism is high. So you can see there is a real effect uh, of mm -hmm. this uh, you know, information, disinformation campaign, uh, which, which is in Western societies in particular. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, a, a serious problem. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'll give you a concrete example. Last, last June, June of last year, I presented my book, Putin's War Against Ukraine, in the Ukrainian parliament, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and there was a German uh, visiting student there, post probably a PhD student, and her question was, "What do you think of anti-Semitism in Ukraine?" And I thought to myself, "You're from Germany. You're asking somebody in Ukraine about this question." Um, the the highest levels of anti-Semitic attacks in Europe are in France and Germany. I mean, and it's not necessarily done by Germans and French people. It's done by uh, often by immigrants, by Muslim immigrants. But 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 so the, you know but she has to come to Ukraine to ask this question. She's researching anti-Semitism in Ukraine. Ukraine has very few anti-Semitic attacks. I mean, Jewish organizations in Ukraine they collect statistics on this every every year. I mean, it's on, available on the internet. There are very very few, both uh, published and you know physical attacks. Um, the um, 
you're right about the dis I mean, I recommend anybody listening to this uh, uh, video blog to subscribe free of charge to the EU. Yes, European Union has published something called, since 2015, something called Disinformation Review. And it's published every week. And it's a great survey of what the Russians, um, what Russian lies have been put out every week. And Ukraine is on there all the time. Yes, Ukraine is the is is the is the objective of uh, the high one of the highest objectives amongst many other countries, of course, um, in that information war campaign. And the um, for all Russian nationalists, because they don't see Ukrainians as a separate people, Ukraine is therefore in their eyes an artificial country, and they. They, they strengthen the argument by saying, look, they can't even get their act together on reforms and such like. So, yes, and it's all, it's all part of that same thing. Sadly, you know, the two potential areas that could help in countering that, uh, Ukraine embassies abroad and the Ukraine diaspora, don't do anything. They, they hardly do anything. I mean, Ukrainian embassies have always been bad in terms of PR work. Um, in terms of sort of countering this kind of information war. And the Ukrainian diaspora, like, you know, I lived in Toronto 15 years, the Ukrainian diaspora is very weak in terms of political science. They're very, lots of people who are experts on Holodomor, on Cossacks. <laughs> but, but very, very, you know, very few political scientists um, are of a diaspora Ukrainian background. They tend to be non-Ukrainian diaspora backgrounds the political scientists working on Ukraine. So hence, there, there, aren't, there aren't that many people who are willing to sort of count, counter those, those, na those narratives. But I mean, what is the image of, of Ukraine in Poland? I mean, is it, is it one of crazy nationalist war? Um, I mean, no, I would, I would say no. I would say no because, because of the distance, it's so close, uh, first yeah. and foremost, because of yeah, the, I think the further away you get from Ukraine, the the more this image uh, is reinforced. Um, I, you know, there are some, there are of course always small groups of of uh, you know people who are afraid of banderites and all that. But uh, generally speaking, you know, from from general point of view in Poland, uh, Ukraine has uh, from a societal, societal point of view has a, has a positive uh, positive view. Um, but you know. The, the news, the negative news starts showing up here too, and I think it's important. And, and, it, and it was good that you mentioned the, the EU uh, grouping that, yeah, the disinformation review, they do a lot of really good work. Uh, yeah. Underfunded, underfunded, under resourced, it's a huge problem. Um, from what I understand, conversations with people there, that there is no political support above them, uh, and the political will is very low for the work that they're doing. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it, it is very, very useful and important, and strongly suggest following them as well. The, uh, one of the most ironic aspects of Polish-Ukrainian relations is when you travel to Lviv, Lviv in Polish, because which I've done a few times, and I'll be there in a few weeks' time again. It's full of Polish tourists. I've never heard of a Polish tourist being beaten up, attacked. Even more bizarrely. There's a restaurant in Lviv called the Bunker, which is an Opa bunker. And guess who are the tourists queuing up to go in? Mm. Yeah, Poles. <laughs> Poles. Um, um, they have when you enter the restaurant, um, a little metal hat is put on your head, which is a Moscow detector. So Poles probably get in then, so they they're not they don't get. <laughs> if you look what's up, it's a Moscow detector. Um, the um, and uh, they they speak Polish. No, they don't pretend that they're not Polish. You know, I mean, nobody says why are you speaking Polish here. There's no there's zero um, antagonism, and there's I don't sense any anti-Polish nationalism in Lviv. So that to me is interesting. So even though there's this maybe conflict at the government levels, it, it really hasn't reached the level of kind of lower down sort of shall we say, ordinary people. And of course, you know, tourists are good for money. Absolutely. It, it, actually, I would add to that, I think maybe, maybe there's, in, especially in cities like Lviv, a little bit of um, kind of positive, in a positive sense, nostalgia uh, for, for Poland, because when we go there every year for the, the, the Publishers Forum, 
uh, and uh, our publisher, which is a Polish institution, we have a lot of books that we publish in Polish, and there's always uh, a lot of, especially elderly people who are coming, they just want to speak Polish, and they're looking for materials that they can read, because they, they have a fond memory of pre-war times. Um, so I, I agree, I agree, it's not, it hasn't seeped into, uh, into the societal level at all. No, 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 which is, which is, which, which means that some of the reconciliation, which maybe you're right, didn't go as far as it could have done, has gone some direction forward in the 90s, in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. I think some of it did go forward, obviously maybe didn't deal with everything, um, but, but I mean, Axia Wisla, uh, President Kuchma and uh, President Kwasniewski were very active in that. Um, but so I think it went forward, um, and then that and that also obviously remained. Um, right. I think that influence is still there. Just you really don't see any antagonism. No. Well, I think absolutely Poland is probably one of the best place or uh, com uh, countries for for Ukraine's integration into the European Union. There are so many lessons that can be shared. Um, and that's why it's so painful when we see the, the problems with the relations at the, the highest levels. Um, I think that Poland, it, it generally speaking, again, they're still on the tech levels and economic relations are very good. And they have been uh, quite strong uh, since 2014, since uh, the revolution. Uh, and, and even further since signing the association agreements and the, the DCFTA with the European Union, Poland is a, a strategic economic partner for Ukraine. Um, and, and Ukraine is a strategic economic partner for Poland. A lot of Polish investment is now going into, into Ukraine as well. Um, and you can go to supermarkets in Ukraine and you'll see more and more Polish goods uh, in, the, in the supermarkets there. So I think there is a, some solid evidence that the economic cooperation uh, is important and is taking place. <clears throat> um, but and, and let's be hopeful that the political the political clashes don't stop that, and that the, this economic cooperation can continue. So I, I yeah I, I totally agree that the, the the role that Poland can play for helping bring Ukraine into Europe is 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 important. It's it's um, probably one of the best placed, but not the only. I think there are other countries. I mean, obviously Germany for for Ukraine should and probably does play an incredible incredibly important role for Ukraine's economics, particularly because of the fact that Germany's plainly put the strongest economy in Europe. Um, so there are other partners, but Poland, for sure, is, 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 is importantly placed there. You know, there are different ways of looking at this. The, um, Poland is, of course, going to be always a close ally for all sorts of reasons. You know, most Ukrainians and Poles can get on with the same, you know, speaking similar languages and, and such like. That's not true of Hungarians, for example, or Romanians. Very few Ukrainians know Hungarian or Romanian. Um, Slovakia is too small um, to be sort of um, uh, a kind of a, that kind of partner. And the Czechs always had a kind of a more um, pro-Russian, in some ways, orientation. Um, I would say that they were kind of, they, wanted, they didn't really want to deal with the Ukrainians and such like. So in that sense, Poland. But there are other countries that um, are good allies of Ukraine, Europe, I would say Sweden, for example, uh, UK. Um, the, um, there are others which are more Russia-friendly, uh, France, France, Italy, Greece, Germany used to be, less so now. But let's not forget that the third and fifth, uh, the parties that came third and fifth in the last German elections were all pro-Putin parties, uh, the far right and the far left. So Germany is a kind of a mixed bag there. But, but also we shouldn't forget that the EU and NATO are not going to offer Ukraine membership anytime soon. Um, what, what the EU is offering at the moment is an integration without membership, and that's all Ukraine's going to get from the EU for the time being. It's not, there, isn't, there isn't support for uh, Ukraine to join the EU, and also uh, Ukraine, EU and NATO don't usually let countries in with bits of their territory under foreign occupation. Although there's always double standards in international relations, Cyprus somehow got it. <laughs> and, and West Germany joined NATO with half of its territory under Soviet occupation. But anyway, um, the, um, so, I don't, so I don't think that's the case. But I mean, uh, there must be a lot of, um, also a lot of, besides economics, there must be a lot of 
security cooperation taking place as well. And I'll give you one example of why I say that. I was staying in the Hilton Hotel for a conference a couple of years ago, and, and as I was coming down to breakfast, next to me was standing a U.S. Army officer from the, from the Rangers Special Forces. He wasn't happy. He, 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 was, he was wearing his uniform. Um, I was a bit surprised, and I said to him, "I guess you're not here for tourism in Kiev." Um, and um, and and I followed him out to the front front pate, and he was picked up by Polish officers. So you know, there's there's there obviously something going on at the level like special forces, special operations, and such like. And and I think there is a growing feeling that there's a, a need in NATO to have something like PFP plus, Partnership for Peace plus, mm -hmm. which is similar to the EU's integration with that membership. Uh, there isn't support within NATO for to bring Ukraine in, but there's something, there's a need to uh, dramatically expand cooperation with Ukraine, as there is with Finland and Sweden, by the way, as well, because they can't really join NATO at the moment as well because of domestic opposition. But, but because of the new realities of what Russia's up to in, in our region of the world. So I, I mean, I think on, on that level, um, you, Ukraine um, and Poland, that's probably already taking place. So going back to Adam's first point about um, what kind of government is in power in Poland, yes, it's not a hardline nationalist government, because there are obviously pragmatists within it, and and those pragmatists are the ones who are saying no. We still could, we might be knocking the keep criticizing the Banderites and looking for them under every rock and stone, but we're also going to continue with technical assistance, security assistance, because that's in Polish national interests. So in that sense, they're not the crazies, shall we say? I mean, they they are a mix of you know romantic nationalists and pragmatists, um, and. Um, and so that's good from that point of view that they understand that, um, you know, if it's not Ukrainians fighting the Russians, then it would be the Poles, to be quite, to be quite frankly. Um, um, and actually, that, if I may add uh, to the security element, because there is uh, also the joint Polish-Lithuanian-Ukrainian brigade, which has been functioning now for the last several years. Um, and that's, uh, that's quite an interesting compilation, because you have two NATO members and one non-NATO member who are focusing on uh, you know, integration issues, uh, interoperability, uh, joint planning, drills, strategic planning, and all that. Uh, so it's again, it's another element of bringing Ukraine into the fold, but not giving them full membership uh, prospects into into a NATO type of security element. Uh, integration without membership again. The um, and and I, I was just uh, involved in some um, online simulations uh, about a week ago and um, where we did discuss the whole need for uh, countries on Russia's edge, as it were, like the Baltic states and Poland, to learn from Ukraine. Ukraine is the only country really that's experienced a whole range of hybrid war activities from Russia. The, the, the huge amount of experience that Ukraine soldiers and officers and intelligence officers have from what the Russians have been up to could be extremely useful for NATO, particularly because of the great, less so in the case of Poland, of course, I don't think the Russians are stupid enough to invade Poland, um, but certainly to do high, if the Russians were going to do anything, they'd be doing hybrid warfare in Narva, in northeastern Estonia, or in eastern Latvia. So so Ukraine has a lot to offer there. And, I, and, I, and I'm, so in that respect, I, I'm sure there's, progress there's a movement forward yeah. so yes there's a there's a it's not all dark and negative adam thank you very kindly it's very nice to meet you for the first time i hope it won't be the last thank you thanks uh, for having me yeah i hope so too taras thank you very kindly okay then thank you no, thank bye. you bye-bye see you in March. next month okay thanks william